Good morning, and welcome to Fairhaven Baptist Church. It's good to see everybody back. And we'll pray for those who still are not back. We still give that opportunity for everybody. You just come when you're comfortable. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we've been pretty steady with those who have come back. And so that's exciting to us. And it is good to be uh, back here with people out here instead of just talking to a camera. So uh, let's open our service with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this Lord's Day. And we thank you for the opportunity to be back in your house again. Another place where, uh, back to where we can worship you. Lord, we do thank you that during this time that we have had the opportunity of worshiping you in our living rooms, in front of the TV or in front of our computers. But Lord, it's not the same. And I pray that you'll continue to guide and direct each one of us in this uh, family and in our community around us. Keep us safe from this uh, uh, COVID. And I just pray also, Lord, that uh, you might work, continue to work in the hearts of all of the community and even us who uh, already know you as personal Savior, that we might grow in that salvation. Lord, until you bring us home. Lord, we pray that you bless this service now. And we ask also that you be with our pastor and his wife, who is in, she's in extreme pain because of uh, issues at the hospital this week. We pray that you would raise her up from that, give her strength. We ask it in Christ's precious name. Amen. All right. Let's sing together. <clears throat> Number 306 in your hymnals, and let's stand together as we sing. Jesus saves. <laughs> Unto them, and has committed unto us 
the word of reconciliation. Now, then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Again, verse 21. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In my house I have uh, verses that I printed off and I put on the wall. 21 is one of them that I've got printed on my wall. Amen. What a great way to remember the scripture. Let's sing again. Our worship song, I Run to Christ. that uh, there's a lot of decorations around the church. Someone mentioned Stratigos is going to come this weekend. Hey, they're going to see all of our Vacation Bible School uh, stuff, and, and they're going to say, are we at the right place? And, uh, yeah, lots of stuff all over the hallways, the rooms. Uh, it's great to see. So we're, we're getting ready. We're getting excited. Vacation Bible School uh, is going to be the third full week of July, the week of the 20th through the 24th. 
Monday through Friday. So put that on your calendars to join us on that time. Let's sing again. Number 307 in your hymnal, Send the Light.
living he loved me, dying he saved me. It doesn't follow English if you do what I say, but look at it. Living he loves me, present tense. He loved me before that time of the cross, and that's what sent him to the cross. That was the decision. He said, I've got to be there. I've got to go through this. But he still loves me. Living, he loves me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. But he still loves me. And now, it doesn't fit in this language. I understand that. Uh, but it's, it's an awesome thought. Awesome thought. You may be seated. still a teenager, and once a year we would have one uh, special lunch, luncheon, dinner, whatever you call it, event that took place, and it was a birthday event. We like birthday events. This birthday event was very special. They had 12 tables. Didn't matter how many people they had, they had 12 tables, and each of the tables represented one month. If your birthday was in that month, you sat at that table. Whether you liked the people that was there or not, that's beside the point. That was your table. That's your month. Each one of them had a theme centerpiece. So they had the label as to what month it was, and they had a centerpiece that went with that month. January, for instance, had all kinds of, of the graffiti, and, or graffiti, um, <laughs> Confetti, boy, I, and I'm going to mess up on that a little bit later too. So remember that word for me. <laughs> Celebration type confetti for the first year, first of the year, a new year. That was pretty slick. Then uh, February, love had hearts all over the table, and a centerpiece of a big, big heart right in the middle of it. I remember this well. March. What holidays in March? There's nothing there. Irish. Irish gets that one. So green, green clover leaves and, and everything through the, the month of March for the centerpiece. April is the resurrection. April, they had the centerpiece of a cross and an empty tomb. Had to have both of them together. 
Yeah. Can't have just one. Right. That's awesome. May, graduation. They had a graduation hat kind of on, on an angle there and, and uh, little scrolls made up. And uh, that was the centerpiece for May. It was pretty, pretty good. June. Oh, we're going to skip June. <laughs> July. We'll come back to June. July. Independence. So they had fire, firecrackers and flags type of, of a centerpiece there. I like that. August. Back to school. Back to school. And uh, uh, I remember they had a, a stack of, of little miniature books uh, with a teacher stuck on top of it. Back to school time for August. September, Labor Day. So they had a variety of workers. That's where our kids get these ideas, firemen, policemen, and all these things that they want to be when they grow up. Those are our heroes. And they had those as a centerpiece right there in the middle of the table. October, Halloween. So they had a Halloween style of a centerpiece. Halloween for a centerpiece. Since we didn't want to put the witches to all the all the stuff in there. It's a whole lot like the next one for November, which is a harvest style for Thanksgiving. Uh, so we have, have pumpkins on each one of those two tables. November's Thanksgiving for a harvest style of a centerpiece. And I remember they had that, like a shock of green that would stand right there in the middle of that table, just a little short thing, and the pumpkins and things around the outside of that. Very special. The last one, Christmas. I mean, December, Christmas. <laughs> they had a picture of a manger scene, uh, or a, a manger scene set up right there for the centerpiece. So now let's go back to June. June. They had a wedding cake topper as a centerpiece. It's the month for marriage. So many get married. What do you think, David? Uh, one day before yours, and many years before yours, my mom and dad got married. It's the month for marriage, and so they had a wedding cake topper right there, center centerpiece on that table. That's June. You know, there's going to be a wedding one day. There's going to be a wedding in heaven one day. It's just waiting for us, waiting for that time. So I want to look for for a little bit here this morning. What what is what goes into uh, planning a wedding or preparing for a wedding? It has to start with getting to know you, getting to know you, getting to know all about you. Yeah, it's that time of courtship. That's time where we just meet somebody and say, "Hey, you want to hang out with me for a while?" You want to do, you know, go out for, for a meal or something uh, or, or whatever. It's, it's time we use to just get to know them. I remember my uh, daughter and son-in-law when they got to know each other. And uh, their time was three months long before the wedding. I said, now, you're missing out on one thing is that getting to know your portion. So... One thing the two of you are going to do, I'm going to sign this to you. You're going to read some books together. You're going to do some Bible studies together. You're going to do these things together uh, over and over again. And they were two hours, they lived two hours apart. Does that sound familiar too? <laughs> but getting to know you, time for a court. I want you to look, uh, and, and I've got a lot of scripture, and when I have a lot of scripture, uh, it's going to be impossible for you to turn to those, but I want to mention these things. Uh, as we go through this. Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 35. They said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, or in the same manner, the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And he said unto them, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then and they shall fast in those days. Well, it's a picture that uh, Jesus was with his disciples, and, and they didn't do all the fasting and praying uh, 
was talk, talking about fasting often, it mentioned making prayers. I couldn't see them really making too many of the prayers of Pharisees because they, uh, they were good enough they didn't need God, remember? They were so fair, you see. And so, but they had their own disciples too. They had those that they trained. One of those could possibly have been Saul of Tarsus. He grew up and he, he was one of those Pharisees during this time, probably not. But he was one of them. Why do the disciples of John, they fast office, you know, John the, the uh, baptizer, they fasted often, they made their prayers, and, and our disciples, they, they fast and they make prayers, but yours don't. He says, well, see, this is the time that the bridegroom is with them. There is a time when we are side by side. At this time, we're not calling bridegroom and bride because we're just in that court time. We have each other together. In today's society, I can still see it. They can sit two feet apart and still pull out their cell phone and talk to each other on the cell phone. Can't you picture that today? Today is so mixed up. But they, the bridegroom was with them. They didn't need to call heaven to talk to him. They had him right there beside them. It's a time of courting. And it gives us that picture that one day, the bride of Christ, Christ being the bridegroom, is going to take place. And we know that through scripture teaching, that that is a time from the cross and beyond. We are the bride of Christ if we are believers. Let's go to Luke chapter 7. And verse 37 through 39, and behold, anytime I see that word, I, I think God's getting ready to draw us a picture. He says, behold, look at this. I want to show you something. Behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. So let me fill you in real quick. One of the uh, Pharisees, his name was Simon, not to be confused with Simon Peter, not to be confused with Simon the zealot, who were both apostles or disciples of Jesus. He was a Pharisee, Simon. And he invited Jesus to come over to his house for a meal. And this woman in the city, when she realized that he was there, she came in and ministered unto him. So I'm going to start that over again, verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, began to wash his feet with her tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spoke within himself, nothing audible, to himself, this going through my mind, this man... If we really were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is that touches him. She's a sinner. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw and spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. We are sinners saved by grace. During this time of courtship, we find the faults and the uh, different uh, quirks about him or her. As we go through this time, we learn them about them. Jesus obviously knew all about this woman, but there were certain things that she did to Jesus. I want to look for just a moment. This was the sinner. Remember that. This is the sinner. She stood at his feet. We need to be close to the one we love. With Jesus, are we close to the one we love? The one who loves us? Do we stand at his feet? Do we sit at his feet? Weeping. And she began, that's because of the sin. She began to wash his feet with tears. Washing his feet is also a picture that uh, of, of humility or servanthood. Jesus said to his disciples there at the Last Supper, pretty much over. He said, you are the ones who've been with me in all my sufferings. You've been my servant. Now I want to be your servant. I'm going to pray for you, Peter. And then he went and died for them. 
we should have the heart to want to minister to the person we're falling in love with. She kissed him and anointed him with ointment, made him special in her eyes. The next thing we do is we pop the question. And that was seen with Abraham uh, and his servants when Abraham sent his servant to go find a bride for his son, Isaac. The servant said, how will I know she's the one? Well, you're going to ask her. And if she wants to, she's going to come. What if she doesn't want to come? Do I come and get the son and take him again to the, the homeland? No, no, no. No, no, you're not going to take him back to the homeland. You're going to bring her if she wants to come. If she doesn't want to come, you're free from this oath. The Holy Spirit is in this world, and he's, re he's going out into highways and byways, and he's trying to find those who are willing to become the bride of Christ. Those are the ones who he wants to turn to the Lord, and he's going to make sure they get home. The Holy Spirit. So we pop the question, will you have me? Will you have me? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Ephesians chapter 1, or verse 4. We're chosen in Christ. It says, according as he hath chosen us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without the blame before him in love. We're chosen before the foundation of the world, before God ever started building this whole world that we live on today. He chose us, knowing that we were going to be sinners, knowing that we were going to turn away from Him, and knowing that the penalty had to be death. God chose us in Christ. It was, the, it was as though He turned to His Son and He said, Son, I have great favor to ask of you. You see, I love these people but they can't do it. We'll never fellowship with them. I need you to die in their place. Not only that, son, you're going to actually become their sin. They're on the cross. You're going to take their place. It, this, this thought is when his son would have said the words, Father, I love them too. You know I'll do it. He's chosen us. At that point, God chose us to be his very own. And all he wants through history, all he wants through time is for us to choose him. All he wants us to do is choose him. This is very important in this picture that we're looking at. What if she says no? You're free from the oath. You're free. She can say no. But for those who say yes, Let's look at this. In Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and then 10 through 13. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the, king, to the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And the apostles, when they were returned, told him that they, all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. And the people, when they knew it, followed him. And he received them and spoke unto them of the kingdom of God and healed them that had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, then came the twelve. They said unto him, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the towns and the country round about, and lodge, get victuals, For we are here in a desert place. Hey, there's no provisions out here. Jesus, you've got a lot of people here. But he said unto them, you give them to eat. They said, we, we have no more but five loaves and two fishes. What are we going to do? Except we should go and buy meat for all these people, thousands of people. It's all, and in other words, they're saying to the Lord, in essence, this is impossible. What do you mean? We give them to eat. So the picture here with the feeding of the 5,000 starts not with the preaching, but with the disciples. 
He gave them power and authority all over all devils and cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. They were out preaching the kingdom of God. Fantastic. When they came back, they had a situation. They looked at us and said, oh, doggies, this isn't going to work. It's getting dark. We got to send them away. Lord, don't you realize you've been preaching for too long? It's time to quit service. Haven't you been watching the clock? <laughs> it's time to send them home so they can eat something, so they can get some rest. You've been out there what, preaching the kingdom of God. This is a kingdom of God picture, disciples. I'm going to show you a picture of the kingdom of God. You're going to feed them. You see, God takes care of us who is his. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us or turn his back on us. He'll never walk away. He'll always be there. We have our needs, and they're impossible in this world. He said, you give them to eat. Well, we know the rest of the story. He took the little boy's fishes and bread and, and, uh, and broke it blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. They fed the 5,000. They, they took up basket after basket after basket after basket after basket after basket. Whole mess of it. It wasn't even that much when he got out of the lunchbox, was it? The kingdom of God. God has already popped the question. What's our answer going to be? Who do we say he is? Let's go to verse uh, uh, chapter 9, 18 through 20. Luke chapter 9, 18 through 20. And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, Who say the people that I am? And they answering said, John the Baptist. Uh, but some say Elijah. And others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. He said of them, but whom do you say that I am? Peter answering said, you are the Christ of God. The Christ, the Savior sent from God. You are the one. As long as we recognize who he is and we choose him to be ours, we become the bride of Christ. We have to recognize who he is what he has done for us. Oh, there's one other thing. After we do our courtship thing and, and after we uh, pop the question and, and both of them say yes, there's something else. We prepare for the event. And in, in the, this world, uh, Scripture talks about numbers and, and it has this number 40 as a preparation time or as a time of waiting, a time of growth. We go through a lot of things in this world, and we think, and, and I see Rick here, and I remember when I was very young, and I was on my own. I didn't have my dad to fix my car. When the car went down, I was up a creek. I didn't know beans uh, about mechanics. I had to find somebody that could do those things for me, and I was scared to death when things went bad. When I ran out of money, oh, no, now what do I I have no clue what to do. Um, I'm still learning these things. Well, we all go through things, and a lot of times, those things are totally out of our control. But God allows them to help us grow. During your courtship time, you get to know each other. You go through some of these things together. And especially when you pop the question, and she says yes, now you're almost committed. When Joseph and Mary were at that very stage in their relationship, they were preparing for the event. They were espoused together. They were engaged. They were going to be married. And during that time, they were husband and wife. During our time, we are the bride of Christ. Even though we've not met him face to face yet, we're still waiting for that time. So we prepare for the event. Go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, 1 through 6. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me. Why would he say that? They're two of the same person. You believed in God all this time. God is here in the flesh, he's saying. You believe in the Father. You believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, or rooms as some translations put it, built on adjacent to Father's house. It's the same type of a picture. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We understand it is only through the cross. It is only through the finished work of the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that we can get to heaven. Paul had that opportunity to stress the difference between repentance and the finished work of the cross. On one of his missionary journeys, he went back to a place he had ministered to before. <clears throat> Somebody else had come and ministered to the people while he was gone back to Jerusalem. He came back and this other person had left. And he preached the repentance of John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. John, if you remember right, he said to the people, and a lot of them were scribes and Pharisees who had nothing to do with the God that they supposedly worshipped, that the, they did the work for, <clears throat> the ministry to. And he said, oh, you den of vipers, snakes, sin." Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. You see, John was on the front side of the cross. Jesus hadn't yet finished the work. He came to complete the law. The law said a sacrifice has to be made. And so he was preaching repentance. This person went to this, this city and preached repentance like John the Baptist did. So when Paul came back, he saw the work that this other person had done. He didn't rebuke them, say, you got it all wrong. He just completed the story. Let's go on from this. I want to show you more perfectly what Christ did on the cross. He became that sacrifice, and they became believers. It is through that cross that we accept Christ as our personal Savior, that we are saved, we are redeemed from our sin. Matthew 25, and I'd like for you to turn to that if you would, uh, because most of our scripture at this point is going to be between Matthew 25 and Matthew 22, so if you'd like to uh, follow there and uh, go back and forth with us, you're, you're more than welcome, you're more than able to, and to keep up. Matthew 25, Matthew 22 and Matthew 25, the verses are on the kingdom of God. The teaching is on the kingdom of God. The timing is on the, or the pictures of what we're looking for is on the kingdom of God, his coming, his setting up his kingdom. So Matthew 25, 1 through 13, we're going to begin with that. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened or pictured as these ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom come, cometh, go ye out to meet him. And all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. We're going to stop for just a moment. I want you to picture this. We are during that time of the ten virgins in reality. We're at that time waiting for the bridegroom to come back and call us. The picture was this waiting period, uh, setting up for the wedding. The wedding is yet future. We, we grow and we, we still come to know each other, but we're planning for that event. We're waiting for and anticipating that event to happen. We are like the ten virgins. He uses virgins because they're not yet 
married. Ten foolish and, or five foolish and five wise. The wise is that picture of those who turn to the Lord and say yes to the pop, the question thing. We want to be yours. They brought with them oil and their lamps. Oil in their lamps and oil beside the lamp. It was very specific. Oil and their lamps. The foolish brought their lamps with oil in it. Foolish, just like me with money problems when I was younger, I, okay, it's green, I can spend it. It's green, I can spend it. Whoops, we ran out of green. Now what am I going to do? They were foolish. They didn't plan ahead. They didn't see the event coming on yet in the future. We get to see that time. We are living in that time. We get to anticipate it. Those of us who have accepted his personal, him as personal Savior who have been given something very special. That Holy Spirit is pictured through the oil in the lamps. You see, the wise have the oil that never runs out. They have the oil in their lamps. They can see their steps along the way as they make decisions. They go through trials of life. But they've got the oil that's going to get them home. They've got the Holy Spirit to be with them until that day that the Lord Jesus comes back. Can't you imagine? At midnight, the call comes out. Lyle, are you ready? Wow. Is he going to call our names? Is he going to call our names? Are you ready? The wise answered saying, no, 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 no. Not so. Lest there be not enough for us and you. You go rather to those that sell and buy for yourselves. They were going to go. They were going to buy oil for their lambs, but they weren't going to get the Holy Spirit. We know the rest of the story. The Holy Spirit came, or the master came, the bridegroom came and took them away, and the foolish were left out, similar to the, uh, the great flood. Those in the door, inside the ark, God shut the door. After this point, no decisions can be made. Those inside were safe. Those outside were not safe. The journey. Let's look at Matthew 25, 14 through 18. And then verse 29, we're going to tag on to the end of that. This is the journey. For the kingdom of heaven is like a, a man traveling to a far country. Oh, another picture. Who called his own servants and delivered them unto them his goods. Unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several abilities. And straightway he took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them five more talents. And likewise he that received two, he also gained the other two. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. For unto every one the half shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even what he has. In between those last two verses that I read, the Lord rebuked the one, he praised the other two. And he says, it's because of your heart. You knew I was a God of judgment, and you took what I've given you. God has given every person who walks this earth the ability to see him, even in creation. God has given it so everyone knows who he is and everyone is without excuse. This one went and buried it. It's, it's like, I'll put you in a closet, Lord. I'm not ready for you yet. My time is with the world and my friends. I'm going to party down. And one day, when it's convenient, I'll open the closet door. Dig it up. I'll give it back to you. I have chosen against. Five foolish, five wise, one who took his talents and gave them and used them for the Lord. Another one who used his talents and used them for the Lord. But there was the foolish. The foolish servant who 
more or less, hid God in the closet and said, I don't have time for you. We prepare for the event. One day, one day, it hasn't happened yet. Why hasn't it happened yet? We're still here. The bride is still here. But one day it's going to happen. The world is saying, oh, come on, Christians. Really? He hadn't showed up. It's it's just a a, a, a thought out there in the, in the sky, and it's, in, and it's not real. He hadn't showed up yet. Of course he hadn't showed up yet. We're still here. The bride is still here. But Jesus said to his disciples, I'm coming again. That's a promise, and God never reneges on a promise. Yeah. He is coming back. We see the signs all around us in this world, and sometimes it gets scary. I understand that. Sometimes you just wonder, what's the end of this COVID? What's the end of all, all this stuff that's happening in our, our government or governments around the world? What's going to take place? I'm not really sure. We can't really say for sure. But we know he's coming back. We know he's coming back. The wedding date has been set. We know it's going to take place. Wow. Here comes the bride. Groom. <laughs> I had to put that in there. We play that song. We, uh, here comes the bride. The bridegroom and the preacher comes up to the front of the church and they stand there. And all of a sudden we hear the music start over here because the pianist is paying attention to the world. Uh, he's, he's beside himself. He doesn't have a clue what's going on. He's, you know. And the preacher, you know, he's, he's looking at his notes, getting ready and and I think, okay, I'm ready for this. All of a sudden, the music starts. Everybody stands up. And we turn around. There's the bride, all decked out. Beautiful as can be. Going through his mind is, wow, is she mine? <laughs> and dad escorts her up to be given bridegroom. We have the bridegroom coming for the bride. What a spectacular time that's going to be. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, just that fast, we are in his arms. Can you imagine it? My mind doesn't go that fast. <laughs> I'd like to imagine it. My mind doesn't go that fast. What an awesome day that's going to be. Here comes the bridegroom. Matthew 22. Let's go back a few pages to Matthew 22. And I want you to see these verses. Matthew 22, the first 10 verses. <clears throat> All is set. Come on in. All is set. Come on in. Sit right down. Make yourselves comfortable. And Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by parables and said... The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. That would be an arranged marriage. Dad's taken care of it. I like that. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come into the marriage. Come on in. Sit down. Prince of the bride. Come have your seat. Make yourselves ready. Everything's prepared. Verse 5. But they made light of it, went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and treated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard of it, he was wroth. He sent forth his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then said he to the servants, The wedding is ready. <clears throat> But they which were bidden were not <clears throat> worthy. They're not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. But because of the blood of the cross, I have been made worthy to be there on that day, on that occasion, as the bride of Christ. They've turned away from him. They've said no to pop the question. They're not worthy to be in my house, to be part of this wedding. Not worthy. Verse 9. Go ye therefore into the highways, out into the streets, every place you can think of. As many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, gathered together as many as they found, both 
bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Awesome. What guests were there? The bride was there. The bride was there waiting for this wedding to take place. Awesome image. The Bible says, for all of sin will come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. There's none that does good. There's none that seeketh after him. And I'm a bride of Christ if I realize that Christ paid my penalty there on the cross because he chose me. And I can say yes to his gift of salvation. He provided that gift of salvation on the cross. The penalty of my sin was paid for. All I have to do is reach out and accept it. All I have to do is say yes to the bridegroom. There's one more thing. If I'm wearing the wedding garment. Let's read the rest of this scripture. Chapter 22 of Matthew. 11 through 13. And when the king came to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. He said to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping of tea. That person is unsaved. He's not dressed for the wedding. He's not wearing the wedding garment. You say, what's, what's the difference? And if the bride is the only ones in there for this wedding, for this feast, how could somebody else come in the door? Surely they could screen him. Surely he wasn't brought by the Holy Spirit into heaven. There are so many in our churches today. Just think about it for a moment. I can't say this is exclusive, this is what it's talking about, but just, just think of it for a second. When Paul was taken captive and he went to, uh, before some of the rulers, <clears throat> he had a chance to witness to them, tell them about Christ, the finished work on the cross. And one, Felix said, you almost got me persuaded. You almost got me to the point I said yes to the bridegroom. How many of us in our churches sit there, we know the lingo, we know the reading, we read the scriptures, we've heard the sermons over and over and over again, and yet we've never answered Christ's question. Will you have me? And we're going through all the actions. Uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a feeling. I, I, I can feel it. I, I get high spiritually high. I, I enjoy the service. I enjoy coming together and getting this other type of personality uh, away from the world. But we've never said yes to the Holy Spirit. We've never said yes to the bridegroom. Thus, we don't have the Holy Spirit. We don't have that oil in our lamps. Could it be he's giving us a picture with this one without the wedding garment being there? still unsaved. We're close. We're close. I truly believe that it is not a growth situation into salvation. It is a choice. Mm -hmm. A choice is a determined decision in our mind to turn from the world and turn unto Christ as Savior. The growth comes after that as we prepare for the event, as we get closer to our Lord and Savior. I want to close with the thought, has he heard your answer yet? Have you said yes? You know, when we see him, what are we going to see? In heaven, he's still going to have those nail prints in his hands, the hole in his side. It's still going to show that he was the one 
who died on the cross. He was the reason we get to be there in the first place. He is the bridegroom. We are the bride. Unworthy that we may be. And we are dressed in white robes of righteousness. His is spotted with blood. If any of you, whether here or on TV or uh, in your living room, have never made a choice, a determined choice to accept Christ as your personal Savior, that finished work on the cross, remember, he didn't just die. He rose. He rose. He rose. He's alive. He's not like the idols they made in the Old Testament and worshipped. I created this thing, now I can worship and bow down to this thing who is now my God. I created it, he's my God. Does that make sense? Our God is alive. Mm -hmm. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He says, all I want you to do is to choose me. Just say yes. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, in this life that you have promised to come back. You have promised to take us to where you are. You've prepared a place for us. And we are going to be the bride of Christ for all eternity. We're so unworthy. We thank you for all that you've done. When you ask us, who do you say that I am? Oh, let us say you are the Christ, the Savior of the world. Lord, we ask that you touch hearts all over the internet, all over this sanctuary. Make sure that we've accepted